here now is how to get the story out and how to get it told. That's the challenge that lies ahead. There's no question in my mind that it can be done, and you're going to see an exerted effort. I have some degree of optimism to believe in the weeks, months ahead that this organization will become economically sound, never again to be challenged as to whether or not we will be here from now on. We talked this morning somewhat about the 50 cent federal tax. And I want to report to those that were not here that this organization did register protest. The Bylaws Committee only yesterday asked that we take some positive action. The board was in session this morning until 2 o'clock. The board did take action. We have filed charges against the United States government. <laughs> Alleging that that law and that act was illegal and unconstitutional, and that they should return back to producers any monies collected from that fraud which they perpetrated. I want to reminisce just a little bit with you now and talk about something that excites me as I do, part of it. Others, it becomes an experience that I lived with you. We recognized many years ago, the leadership of the organization did, that dairy farmers were not being treated fairly. And because of that, we recognized that the structure that had been established was not really in effect representing their interests, but their own. We went to them, we others, went to them and explained to them what we sensed was happening and suggested that this organization and them work together, that we form a marketing agency in common. They maintain the structure for procurement and this organization be the marketing agent, the bargaining agent for that group of dairymen. They ask a question that spelled out to us very rapidly what the future was ahead. They said, what are you going to do with the profits that you make from this arrangement? The answer was, there really won't be any. We're a nonprofit organization. The marketing expense will be deducted, and the balance will be returned back to the farmer. They couldn't understand that type of an arrangement, and it became very obvious that we were diametrically opposed to goals and purposes. We recognized then that we would have to go out and organize dairymen under a collective bargaining structure and become that agent that we had recommended to others that we be. For many years, we began to grow in strength in heavy dairy areas. We began to influence markets. We began to expand the organization into unknown territories until we reached down into southwest Missouri. When we went into that area, it was the hometown territory of mid-America, around Springfield. They sensed us coming, and they sensed the threat that was there, and they made two attempts to stop us. One was is to transfer assets or borrow monies and outpay us and our producers, which they were successful in doing, but they didn't stop us. Our producers understood what was happening, and they stuck. Recognizing that they weren't going to be able to fragment us at that point, they took the next step. 
sensing that if they could cause enough economic burden to be shouldered by this organization in their own terms, they would break her back. And people, they nearly done it. I suppose only we will know how close they will never know. But they nearly done it. They filed a suit against the organization in March of 1971. That suit was asking us, if my memory serves me correct, for some $9 million in damages, alleging that we were using predatory and anti-competitive efforts to monopolize and control the markets, and we only had 40 producers, and they had the rest. But wanting to hasten our demise, then they circled the others and invited them to come on in, and surely three or four of them could cause enough economic hardships that it could be done very rapidly. When the suit was filed before it went to court, we went in and we sat down, not me but others, and explained to these people what was really happening. We asked them not to do it, not to go through with it because we were farmers, they were farmers, and someone was going to get rich and it would be the legal system. They didn't listen. We said, you know, what you're going to do is force us to expose the co-op structure. We think there's a very fine line about whether or not what you're doing is legal, whether you are given the right to do what you're doing and under the protection of the antitrust laws. We ask you not to do it because it will not only affect dairy, but it will affect the whole co-op structure in the country regardless of what area or commodity it may be in. Don't force us to do it. They wouldn't listen. They went ahead and filed and forced us to expose the co-op structure, what they were doing, and I don't suppose we will ever really understand or know the implications or the effect of this lawsuit. We really haven't seen it go any farther than the point it's at today, but I can assure you it will become a precedence in the court system and it will be referred to from here on. And every attempt or attack on the co-op structure will be based on the disclosures and the discoveries that this organization found and brought to light. And they have put the whole co-op structure in danger. After it hit the courtrooms, we went to them the second time. We only had $80,000 in it. We said, now, fellows, let's stop this monkey business. We went to them the third time and asked them to stop. We had some confidential private meetings that was never to go to the press. No one was to ever know about. We were to sit down and work out some arrangements. Before we get back to the office, they had gone to the news media. They were using us. How many times do you deal with a snake and get bit? Once is enough. We done it twice. After 11 years, out of your pocket and mine, came $11 million in out-of-pocket costs. I'm talking cash. That's the reason you went to Des Moines and sat in that meeting. And in that meeting, there was $5.2 million in cash raised in a matter of hours. And another $5 million in forgiveness of loans. $10 million meeting. It's never been equaled anywhere in America. You done that because you had leadership in the organization that knew what was at stake. Now, they didn't like it. 
They didn't want to do it. How many of you remember the little motel rooms at the National Convention somewhere that you were taken up into and I'm the guilty one along with others and I did never did like it then or now but it had to be done that's a part of our history that you can boast about people you can be proud of because this organization stepped forth in the heat of battle and challenged those who were attacking it came out of the court in January of 1981 the Kansas City Federal Court the judge said as he announced his decision and he only announced it; he didn't write it and the practice is is that they write an opinion and explain why they ruled the way they did and he never explained why he did nor wrote an opinion he just announced nobody's really been hurt boys everybody pick up your marbles and go home that's the first time that we refuse to sit down and talk about stopping <laughs> oh yes the others came then and said hey let's not do this anymore let's be satisfied with what the judge has said and I quote from one of those who answered unfortunately litigation will have to continue because we disagreed with a settlement at that time of nothing he says farmers will have to pay the bill including all legal expenses and since all parties involved are farm organizations they surely will pay the cost he's absolutely right and if they don't want to pay the cost in that organization they better join this one because somebody's going to pay it We appealed that judge's decision. We went to the appeals court in St. Louis. Panel of three judges. It's a good thing, I suppose, the judge had not written an opinion because they didn't have one to study and they had to review the whole case in fact. And then came out with a 74-page document and opinion in August of 1982 and they completely reversed reversed that original decision and I'm not going to read all of it but I got some excerpts that I want you to know what that panel of three judges had to say about what happened and some of these become very significant I just got a few of them underlined I'm not going to read all that but if we win nothing else, there's been some things established here that we have been challenged on, that we knew we were right on, and now the courts have said, yes, you are right. We affirm the district court's conclusion that NFO has not violated the antitrust laws. NFO's organizing and marketing efforts fall within the capra volstead exemption, permitting farmers to band together for the purpose of collectively marketing their products. You now have a legal base to stand on unchallenged by anyone. MIDAM, AMPI, and CMPC did conspire to monopolize milk and eliminate competition through the use of predatory, anti-competitive, and unlawful tactics. Such contact, conduct, Falls, out the cap, falls outside the capra volstead exception and violates Section 1 and 2 of the Sherman Act. The contrary conclusion of the judge is reversed and the case is returned to him for determinum, determination of the amount of damages NFO may recover. <laughs> the district court Factual findings and record 
unmistakably show that AMPI, CMPC, and MIDAM illegally conspired to monopolize grade A milk marketing and to eliminate competition in, such, in the markets of such milk, and that NFO was a specific target of a conspiracy. This conspiracy violates Section 1 and 2 of the Sherman Act, notwithstanding the Capra-Volstead exemption, because it involved the concerted use of predatory and unlawful anti-competitive means to eliminate competition and pursue monopoly power. The record evidence is clearly sufficient to support NFO's conspiracy claim. We recognize that the litigation directly against NFO was intended in part to hamper NFO's ability to compete. The burdensome cost of the litigation was one factor. Notes from internal AMPI meetings and collaborating testimony show, for example, that senior AMPI officials considered sponsorship of additional third-party litigation against NFO in hope that the added cost of such litigation would break NFO's back. Quote, unquote. More serious is the stipulated fact that AMPI ordered the destruction of documents and that some were in fact destroyed involving admitted bonfires. AMPI was involved unlawful, in unlawful political contributions which became the subject of the Senate Watergate investigation. We uncovered the documents where the milk money had been floating around. Because we uncovered those documents that exposed the milk money and the milk crowd that was used in the Connolly episode in the Ellensburg that caused two of their officials to spend time in prison, we were put on Nixon's enemy list. Do you remember? The same time the IRS was turned loose on us, the same time SEC was turned on us, there has never been a farm organization undergo the scrutiny that this one has by the most powerful branches of this government. And we survived and won on every point. According to this panel of three judges, we can only describe AMPI's conduct as outrageous. Perhaps the most outrageous conduct revealed in this case relates to suppression and destruction of evidence by AMPI. The conduct may be described simply, AMPI engaged in a deliberate pattern of shuffling, hiding documents, moving them from warehouses to homes and other locations in an attempt to avoid discovery. That's why we appealed the case. If that conduct had been permitted, the confidence in the judicial system in this country would have been destroyed. No judge can issue a court order and then have it violated to that degree and not penalize and punish the violator if we have a court system. Well, there's a few other things here, but I'm going to pass over them right now. The point is, when we came out of the appeals court with this decision, the panel of three judges said in closing, even NFO's cost on appeal shall be borne in equal share by CMPC, MIDAM, and AMPI. They'll pay the cost for the appeal. You remember as I some of those long, hard days and nights. We held meetings in your counties, in your states. We held them and we took and pleaded with you until you hated to come to a meeting. And you didn't want to be a, bring a friend because we would embarrass you. And we understand that. 
I held my share. I enjoyed all but that part. But because you and I were willing to go on the offensive and attack the violin, well, they didn't like the outcome of the appeals court. They went back to the appeals court and said, hey, we want a rehearing. Now, they can do this. Instead of three judges sitting in, now you have nine. They took the nine, took and looked at the case for a little bit and voted eight to one and denied them a rehearing. The only thing they can do is stall, but they're going to pay. Now, I'll sit down and talk. We'll sit down and talk, but I'll guarantee you talking, it'll be cheap, and they better come with their checkbook. They passed a few million around Washington, and now they're going to pass a few million around Corning. I'm not vindictive, but I got a good memory. <laughs> and anything less than total recovery, I couldn't in good conscience face you in a convention. <laughs> well, be that as you may. Most of that's history. Most of the cost is behind us. I don't know when. I don't know how much. I got a pretty good idea. We're ready to talk to anybody, anytime. The next move is up to them. They know who won. They know, and I'd lot rather be in your seat tonight than I would be in theirs. That's what people can do together. When they decide to do something together in the face of all the odds that we face, that's what you can do. Well, let me in closing say this. I know that we have some weaknesses within the structure of the organization. We have two areas that, in my opinion, must be corrected. We must continue to restructure the grain department so it has management capabilities where it can become self-sustaining. We must continue that. We are now involved in it. We have a firm called Grain Management Incorporated that's taking a look at. They're no stranger to NFO. They have worked with us over the years before. We're taking a look at a restructuring possibility for management purposes. And then I know this, that this organization will never be successful until we get back into the counties, build county structure, county committees, and get them involved with the departments, and that is top priority. <laughs> that will be done just as soon as economics will allow it, and hopefully this winter, this spring. This is going to be the thrust. This is where we're going to do some repairing and damages that have been caused. I extend to you the greetings of your home office. Those that aren't here, and those that are here that work quietly, that you may never know who they are, but who have put this convention together for us. And that staff that's answering the phones and keeping business going, keeping the shop open, back in the home office that you never see, perhaps you never talk to, 
that are committed to the cause as you are. I bring you their greetings, and I'll take yours back to them. Thank you, and good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.